Today, we will cover spinning, spiral dives, and side slips. In the first section of this tape, we will show you how to recognize and avoid conditions that can lead to a spin, how to enter a spin, and the correct recovery action that must be taken. The last section is devoted to spiral dives. Spinning occurs after an aggravated stall and is the auto rotation of the aircraft as it loses height. There is no practical application for the spin in normal flight. You will learn to recognize it, avoid it, and should you go into a spin, recover from it. First, some safety considerations before even attempting this maneuver. Use only an aircraft that has been certified for an intentional spin. This will be indicated by a certificate in the pilot operating handbook or cockpit placards. Be familiar with entry and exit procedures outlined in the operating handbook. The procedures you will see in this video apply to most light aircraft, but some planes have their own idiosyncrasies. Where there are differences, follow the handbook's instructions to the letter. Now, let's look at what happens when an aircraft goes into a spin. In this situation, after the plane has stalled, a roll, yaw, side slip, or turbulence causes one wing to produce more lift than the other. The aircraft then rolls and yaws in the direction of the downgoing wing. As this happens, the wing that drops hits the relative airflow with a greater angle of attack, becoming more stalled. At the same time, the upward wing meets the relative airflow at a smaller angle of attack, giving it more lift. This increases the roll. While this is happening, the drag on the downward wing has increased, which stalls it further. At this point, the nose drops because of the loss of lift, and the aircraft goes into a spin, following a corkscrew path towards the earth. While spinning, the aircraft is simultaneously rolling, yawing, and pitching. As it spins, the vertical and forward speeds are relatively low. Load forces are somewhat greater, but relatively steady. And pitch attitudes may vary from flat to steep. The spin maneuver has three stages. The incipient stage, the fully developed stage, and the recovery. The incipient stage takes place from the time the aircraft stalls and rotation starts until the spin axis becomes vertical or nearly vertical. In light aircraft, this stage occurs very quickly, in about four to six seconds. It consists of approximately the first two turns. Typically, incipient stage motion begins during a stall as one wing drops. As the nose drops, there is an increase in the yawing motion. About the half turn point, the aircraft points straight down. Because of the inclined flight path, the angle of attack is generally greater than that of the stall. Near the end of the first turn, the angle of attack continues to increase and the nose of the aircraft may come up. Going into the second turn, the flight path becomes more vertical. As the aircraft enters the fully developed stage, the spinning motions become more repetitious and stabilized from turn to turn, and the flight path is now nearly vertical. The third stage of the spin is recovery, and we will deal with that later. First, let's look at entry into the incipient stage. There are several ways you can put an aircraft into a spin, whether deliberate or accidental. Keep in mind, the angle of attack, not attitude, is the key factor. You can enter a spin while level, descending, or climbing. A spin may also occur after a high-speed stall. Here is one way to enter a spin. Keep in mind, the aircraft must be fully stalled or it might not spin. Before you begin this procedure, make sure you comply with all safety precautions. Do the cockpit checks. Make sure you are over an unpopulated area and have achieved the minimum altitude for this maneuver. We cannot stress enough that the aircraft used for the spin exercise is certified for this maneuver and is properly loaded. Failure to heed this advice has resulted in several fatalities. Read the type certificate. 
pilot operating handbook, or cockpit placards so you know under what conditions, if any, spin practice may be undertaken in that aircraft. The minimum altitude for recovery from a spin is 2,000 feet, or the height recommended by the manufacturer, whichever is greater. Also keep in mind, unless the aircraft is equipped with gyro instruments that can be caged or withstand sudden changes in attitude, instrument damage may result from this exercise. Now, reduce power to a minimum and stall the aircraft. You do this by gradually applying full aft control column while maintaining a near normal climb attitude. Just before the stall, apply full rudder in the direction of the desired spin. Auto rotation will occur as you maintain full rudder and hold the control column fully back. Ignore the instinctive tendency to release pressure. Allow the spin to continue through the desired number of turns, but never go more than six turns. Approved aircraft are not normally tested beyond these limits. As a rule, two turns of a developed spin should be sufficient for this exercise. Before we talk about recovery, here are some review questions on the material we've covered so far. What are the differences between the incipient and fully developed stages of a spin? What are the differences between the incipient and fully developed stages of a spin? During the incipient stage, the flight path is changing from horizontal to vertical in a short time, about four to six seconds. This stage lasts about two turns. In the fully developed stage, the aircraft is in an almost vertical descent. The roll, yaw, and pitching motions become repeatable and stabilized. True or false, a spin can only be entered from level or downward flight path. True or false, a spin can only be entered from a level or downward flight path. False. The angle of attack is the key factor in the spin, not the attitude. It is possible to enter a spin in a climbing attitude as well as from descending or level flight. At what minimum altitude should spin recoveries be practiced? At what minimum altitude should spin recoveries be practiced? Spin recoveries should never be attempted lower than 2,000 feet or at the height recommended by the aircraft manufacturer whichever is greater. When entering an intentional spin, what is the role of the rudder? When entering an intentional spin, what is the role of the rudder? The role of the rudder is to create yaw, causing one wing to stall before the other. The rudder should be fully applied in the direction of the desired spin. Full rudder should be maintained to allow auto rotation to occur. What is the maximum number of turns a spin should be allowed to progress? What is the maximum number of turns a spin should be allowed to progress? Never continue a spin beyond six turns as approved aircraft are not tested beyond these limits. Now we will deal with recovery from a spin. Again, recovery techniques may vary between aircraft, so make yourself familiar with the pilot operating handbook. The procedures we will describe here are suitable for most small aircraft and may be used in the absence of manufacturer's data. They may be used to recover from either the incipient or fully developed stages. Remember, spin recovery practice should never be attempted at an altitude of less than 2,000 feet or the manufacturer's recommended height, whichever is greatest. The object of recovery from a spin is to upset the balance between the aerodynamic and inertial movements that make the spin possible. First, set the power to idle and neutralize the ailerons. Now, apply and hold full rudder in the direction opposite the rotation. As the rudder reaches full deflection, push the control column forward far enough to break the stall. You may have to have the elevators full down. Hold the flight controls in this position until the rotation stops. As the rotation ceases, neutralize the rudder, level the wings, and recover smoothly from the resulting dive. Recovery time is shorter in the incipient stage, and somewhat lesser control input is needed in this stage. 
In the fully developed stage, the aircraft may go through one or more turns after recovery procedures are carried out before the rotation stops. Be sure to apply the recovery controls in the proper sequence and hold them until rotation stops. Prematurely easing off the controls may extend recovery time. There are other factors that will affect recovery time. They include aircraft loading and distribution, the center of gravity and weight, altitude, aileron, flaps and power. If the aircraft has added weight far from the center of gravity, the inertial moment is increased, causing a more shallow spin attitude and more sluggish recoveries. Forward location of the center of gravity makes it more difficult to get into a pure spin. This is because the elevators are less effective. The farther back the center of gravity and the more weight distributed along the fuselage, the flatter and the faster the spin will become. Weight also has an effect on spin behavior. Higher weights cause slightly longer recoveries. In high altitudes, recoveries may take longer since the air is less dense, reducing the effectiveness of the flight controls. There is no set rule on the effect of ailerons on spin recovery. This varies from aircraft to aircraft. Keep the ailerons neutral until the aircraft is unstalled. Using flaps may cause one of three reactions. They may induce a flatter spin, prolonging the auto rotation at a lower spin rate they may reduce the effectiveness of the rudder because of deflected airflow. Or they may be damaged from high speed or high loading or both during recovery from the dive. If an aircraft enters a spin with the flaps extended, they should be retracted at the first opportunity after initial recovery action has been taken. Leaving the power on lengthens recoveries in some aircraft as well as causing increased airspeed and height loss during recovery. There is a possibility of the aircraft entering a secondary spin. This may happen when you abruptly or prematurely pull up from the dive recovery. It also may occur if yaw is present from the inadvertent retention of anti-spin rudder. Before moving on to the next section with deals with spiral dives, we will stop for a short review on recovery from a spin. Which way should the rudder be applied when recovering from a spin? Which way should the rudder be applied when recovering from a spin? The rudder should be fully applied in the direction opposite of the rotation of the aircraft. What might cause the aircraft to go into a secondary spin? What might cause the aircraft to go into a secondary spin? An abrupt or premature pull-up from the dive recovery may cause the aircraft to go into a secondary spin, or, if yaw is present, inadvertent retention of anti-spin rudder might put you into a secondary spin. True or false, spin recovery is slightly shortened in higher altitudes. True or false, spin recovery is slightly shortened in higher altitudes. False. The air is less dense at a higher altitude, giving less bite for the flight controls to oppose the spin. However, this does not suggest you should use low altitudes for spin practice. What is the effect of leaving the power on during spin recovery? What is the effect of leaving power on during spin recovery? Leaving the power on will tend to lengthen recoveries, increase airspeed, and result in more height loss during the dive recovery. The next section of this tape will teach you how to recognize the conditions that lead to a spiral dive, how to recognize a spiral dive, and the correct recovery action. A spiral dive is a steep descending turn in which the aircraft has an excessive nose-down attitude. It has three characteristics. One, an excessive angle of bank. Two, rapidly increasing airspeed. And three, a rapidly increasing rate of descent. This is neither a normal nor useful maneuver and should never be practiced. It is extremely hazardous, especially at low altitudes. A high speed stall could result if the elevator is used incorrectly to slow the rapid loss of height. As well, the aircraft may sustain structural damage in the pull-up if the loading becomes excessive. 
During a spiral dive, the increasing airspeed may result in structural damage to the aircraft. The sudden loss of height can also be deadly, especially at low altitudes. There is a danger of pilot blackout or a secondary high-speed stall. A spiral dive somewhat resembles a spin. While practicing spins, it is possible to become disoriented so that what appears to be a spin is in fact a spiral. How do the two differ? You recall in a spin the airspeed is at or about stalling speed. In other words, constant and low. The airspeed in a spiral dive is high and rapidly increasing. You can find yourself in a spiral dive by attempting to force the aircraft into a spin too soon before a stall occurs. A spiral may also result if the elevator controls are relaxed once a spin has started. As well, you can go into a spiral dive during a steep turn in which the controls are mismanaged and the nose is allowed to drop. When doing this, make sure the engine throttle is closed to bring the rapidly increasing airspeed under control. This will also reduce the load factor buildup when recovering from a dive. Recovery from a spiral dive is not difficult, but the action must be taken promptly and in this sequence. First, close the throttle. Almost simultaneously, level the wings. Keep the aircraft straight. Now, ease out of the dive. Finally, apply power to maintain height. We cannot stress enough that the spiral is not a maneuver to be practiced. Your flight instructor will demonstrate it for you from an incorrectly entered spin or a poorly executed steep turn. During this exercise, you should notice a sudden increase in airspeed and wing loading. It will be obvious how any attempt to pull out of the dive without first leveling the wings only aggravates the situation. Now, for a quick review of this material. Describe how you would recover from a spiral dive. Describe how you would recover from a spiral dive. First, reduce power and then almost simultaneously level the wings and bring the nose up to ease out of the dive. Finally, apply enough power to maintain height. In recovering from a spiral dive, why is it important to level the wings before easing out of the dive? In recovering from a spiral dive, why is it important to level the wings before easing out of the dive? In this situation, you have the problem of wing loading from the excessive angle of bank. Failure to level the wings before pulling out of the dive will only tighten and aggravate the maneuver. What is the basic difference between a spin and a spiral dive? What is the basic difference between a spin and a spiral dive? A spin occurs at or about stalling speed. In a spiral dive, the airspeed is well above stalling speed and increases rapidly. The final section of this tape will show you the entry, practical use, and recovery from a side slip. Side slipping is a maneuver in which the aircraft is in a banked attitude, but its tendency to yaw is reduced or prevented by rudder control. You can use side slip to lose height without increasing forward speed, increase the rate of descent while turning, or counteract drift while landing in a crosswind. The last is probably the most common use of the maneuver today. With the advent of flaps, side slips are seldom used to lose height or steepen the angle of descent. However, the maneuver can prove to be of great value in the case where the flaps are not working or should you be flying an aircraft without them. There are three types of side slips. The forward side slip, the regular side slip, and the slipping turn. Use the forward side slip to lose height or steepen the glide slope on approach to landing while maintaining the center line of the runway. To get into this maneuver, bank the aircraft in the desired direction and simultaneously apply rudder in the opposite direction to control the degree of yaw needed to maintain direction. Airspeed is maintained by the elevators. 
The angle of longitudinal axis must be constantly adjusted to compensate for changes in wind velocity during landing. This is done by rudder control. There are three ways to recover from the forward side slip. You can release the rudder pressure and allow the aircraft to return to its original heading. Recovery can also be achieved by leveling the wings or adjusting the pitch attitude to resume normal descent and airspeed. In a regular side slip, the longitudinal axis of the aircraft remains parallel to the original heading, but the flight path is moved to the left or the right. The amount of movement is dependent on the steepness of the bank, which in turn is affected by the wind velocity. A regular side slip is executed by banking the aircraft in the desired direction of movement. At the same time, opposite rudder is applied to hold the original heading. To prevent an increase in airspeed, make sure the nose is raised above the normal gliding attitude. This maneuver has limited uses in steepening an approach to landing, but is essential when trying to land in a crosswind. Recovery is achieved by leveling the wings while maintaining your heading. Simultaneously adjust the pitch attitude to resume the desired angle and airspeed to avoid stalling. In the slipping turn, the yaw induced by bank is only partially opposed by applying opposite rudder. It differs from the other two types of side slips because the aircraft changes heading while losing altitude. You would find it useful if you had to lose height during the turn onto the final approach. Before leaving this exercise, a couple of cautionary notes. If during a side slip the airspeed gets too low, the aircraft will seem like it will recover from the maneuver on its own, but it won't recover because of the reduced airflow over the flight control surfaces, especially the rudder. Should you find yourself in this position, recover from the side slip and increase the airspeed before trying it again. As well, the airspeed indicators on most aircraft are prone to error during a side slip. This is because the pitot tube and the static air vents are no longer properly aligned with the relative airflow. Because of the possibility of error, it is important you recognize a correct slipping attitude by the attitude of the aircraft and the feel of the controls. Be careful during recovery. An extreme nose-up attitude could result in a stall. One other precaution. Side slips should not be used to counter a crosswind during the climb following takeoff. Instead, make a coordinated turn into the wind to eliminate drift and maintain a straight path over the runway. Now, take time to go over these review questions on side slips. You find yourself having to land in a crosswind. What actions will you use? You find yourself having to land in a crosswind. What actions will you use? A regular side slip will counteract the drift caused by a crosswind. To execute the move, you would bank into the direction of the wind while using opposite rudder to hold your original heading. To prevent airspeed from increasing, you would raise the nose above normal gliding attitude. During a side slip, you notice the airspeed dropping too much. What action should you take? During a side slip, you notice the airspeed dropping too much. What action should you take? You'll have noticed an excessive nose high attitude as the airspeed became too low. It appeared as though the airplane was beginning to recover from the side slip on its own. Complete the recovery before attempting the maneuver again. Why are airspeed indicators on most aircraft unreliable during a side slip? Why are airspeed indicators on most aircraft unreliable during a side slip? During this maneuver, the pitot tube and static air vents are no longer aligned with the relative airflow, making the instruments prone to error.